You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Today, we're going to talk about how to revive a beloved brand. And we're also going to talk about how to embrace the road trip as part of reviving that brand. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard with Nax. And as leaders often wear many hats, today our guest, she literally wears many hats if you follow her on social media, but she wears many hats in reviving the brand Stuckey's. So welcome CEO of Stuckey's, Stephanie Stuckey. Thanks so much, Jeff. And you're right. I'm CEO. I'm also Chief Branding Officer, Chief Storyteller, Chief Marketing Officer, the Chief Scheduler, and the Chief Legal Officer. I'm sure I left something off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can save it for a different conversation, how many hats you have. But certainly one of the things that you do as an evangelist is in a revivalist, if you will, is you hit the road and then you tell stories about hitting the road. That's right. I think it's really important to understand what your brand is about. And Stuckey's is synonymous or certainly was at our peak, which would have been in the 60s and 70s with the American road trip and is very much in the DNA of our brand as much as our iconic product, the pecan log roll, is that we are about traveling the highway, taking some back roads, exploring America, pulling over and seeing what's there. And so you can't tell the story of Stuckey's without telling the story of the road trip. So for those less familiar with Stuckey's, give us the elevator speech on, on what Stuckey's is. Happy to. So a trip back in the Wayback Machine to 1937 when my grandfather started Stuckey's as a side hustle with a $35 loan from his grandmother and a borrowed truck. And he started buying pecans from local farmers and Eastman, Georgia, and had a little roadside stand. And he quickly realized, like most entrepreneurs, that there was a problem that he could solve. And back then, there really were no convenience stores. There were no chains. There were no pilots or TAs or any of the places that we pull over today, no 7 Eleven. So he really created the first roadside retail chain that offered clean restrooms, gas a hot meal that was quick, cold drinks. He advertised ice cold water, which I love. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, we sold our candies and snacks made from pecans. And we threw in some kitschy souvenirs that to this day still defines our brand. So things like rubber alligators and coonskin caps and tomahawks and all those fun things that people just whine to be pulled over and buy from, you know, make sure their parents pick them up a redneck fly swatter. So that was our brand, and my grandfather built it from nothing. And in 1964, he sold the company. Uh, At our peak, we had 368 stores in 40 states. But it went through a series of corporate hands. The brand, frankly, was trashed. We ended up being owned by a Chicago railroad conglomerate that did not get our quirky roadside Americana brand. And we were in distress. My father got the company back. He righted a sinking ship, but then he retired about a decade ago and left only a handful of people running the company. And we were six figures in debt when my dad's former business partners approached me two years ago and asked me if I want to buy the company. So that's that's a that's a very high level. But when I got the company, we were one hundred thirty three thousand dollars in debt. We do not own or operate any of our stores. And we had a rented warehouse full of dusty inventory that had not turned in years. And to revive (laughs) the brand, you got to do a whole bunch of things. Now, first off, I would imagine your approach, it's like, what do you think of this idea? And you watch enough TV and movies, there's all kinds of different reactions. There's probably, you know, the foreboding music is playing while you think about this. Did you say okay, I'm going to reshuffle my life, or I've been waiting for this. What, what was your reaction to taking the helm? Well, I love my grandfather. And so I think anyone who has a family business can appreciate that. I grew up, even though he sold the company a year before I was born, he was still affiliated with the company for about a decade after that and was involved with the company that purchased it. So I grew up 
road tripping like everyone else in that Woody station wagon. I'm number four of five kids. So I was the one in the way back with no air conditioning and I'd stick my head out and pump my arms and get the truckers to honk. So I remember all of those amazing experiences. And then I saw what had happened to our brand and I would see the stuckies that had been turned into strip joints or completely shuttered. And it just broke my heart. And I thought, our story's not going to end this way. And how often do you get a chance to rewrite your family's business story if you've lost your family business? It just almost never happens. And I just couldn't pass it up. So that began my journey. I have no MBA or previous business experience. And I had to figure things out. But we're making it. We're now profitable. We closed out 2021, uh, 2.4 million net and over 12 million gross sales. And we bought a candy plant and we bought a pecan shelling plant. We're making our product again ourselves. And we're we're catering mostly to sea stores. So that really is sort of the, the heart of our business, people who road trip and that's sea stores. And it's both nostalgia and beyond because I, I think we've done a, surveys and looking at, you know, why do people go on road trips? And one of the things that they listed among higher than anything else, it wasn't that it's convenient. It wasn't that it saves you money. It's that the memories and, and yes, you want to affiliate with the memories. That's, that's an awesome way to start things off, but it also has to taste good and all those other things that people expect. Well, it's also a great way to see America and not only connect with small town America or big cities, but also connect with each other. And in this day and age where so many people are wired and checking their apps, and I do know a lot of cars now have the videos going nonstop, but I really try to road trip with my family and disconnect and use those windshield moments to have real conversations. There's nothing like being stuck in a car together for five, six hours to really start to talk to one another. And so that's that's how memories are made, not 40,000 feet up in the air where these wonderful towns and communities are just a little speck, but you really get to see what's great about this country. And to me, it's so much fun. I would much rather go to the Lunchbox Museum in Columbus, Ohio, than the Metropolitan in New York. To me, that's just as cultural and just as interesting and tells the story of people. And hopefully they have my peanuts lunchbox there. They do. You would love that place. And and some of these smaller places, you get to know the people. The guy who owns it is usually hanging out there and mm-hmm. will give you a private tour. <laughs> so going back to when you inherited the company. Now, you're chief evangelist now. You're on the road all the time. Um, you're branding it. But it had to start with reversing the financial yeah, improving mm-hmm. that. And one of the things you, you started was something called the Thousand Dollar Club. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Yeah. So riding the ship of a, a financially unstable company takes a lot. And I think you have to control your cost. And then you also have to drive sales, right? I mean, you don't need an MBA to know those basics. And so part of it was controlling the cost. So we really looked thoughtfully at trying to rationalize our SKUs and and focus on those core items that are selling. And then looking at where do we have debt and what can we do to to draw down some of that debt to right size our balance sheet. So we had creditors when I bought the company. And so I reached out to all of them or our team reached out to them and and we said, well, we understand we owe you $12,000. And here's the good news. We're going to put you in the thousand dollar club. So we paid them $1,000 a month and slowly but surely we paid off all that debt. And I think one of the the best moments, I have a business partner. I do not do this myself. His name's R.G. Lamar. And the first meeting he had with us when we were going over our accounts payable, we got to one account that we had not been paying down and they, they still had a pretty sizable debt on our, we had a sizable debt on our books to them. And R.G. said, well, what about this account? And we said, oh, well, they haven't invoiced us. So we haven't paid them. And he said, that's not how we do business. You 
you call them and you tell them we've got this debt and we start paying them. And so it just taught me a really important lesson. Not like I didn't want to pay the debt, but it was when you're in financial distress, it's not like you're jumping up and down to pay people you owe money to. So it was, it, there were some tough times there, but we did the right thing and we cut corners so that we could afford to pay people we owed money to. And then we also started driving sales. And I would imagine just like with customers that we talk about this in the convenience store business, you want, you want to go beyond the customer to the relationship and then you yes. want to have advocates, you want to have evangelists. Did, did you also find with the thousand dollar club that, that you had um, people who you owed money to when they said, Oh, we're going to, we believe in them because they are committed to paying us back. And along the way, did you find folks that just said, we want to help you by doing this, this, or this, whether it's just saying great things about the company or something else? Sure. I, a great example is now that they know that we are paying bills and that we're reliable with all the scarcity that's been happening with the supply chain challenges as a result of COVID, our orders are getting filled. So, you know, that's they make those decisions just like we do because we're manufacturing and you're getting a lot of orders in. And yeah, you can do first come, first serve and quite a few do it that way. But if you've got a retail customer, a B2B customer that you know is really someone that you can depend on and it's a relationship, it's not just transactional then yes, that has definitely worked for us. And they're giving us more favorable terms. So maybe they're not giving us a big cut on price because these days the shipping is killing all of us, but they're giving us favorable terms or giving us more time to pay when we need it. And it's reciprocal. We're, we're helping each other. Because it's a relationship business. It always yep. was, it was in 1937 and it still is in 2022. It still is. So you write the ship. And when did you start hitting the road? Was that immediate? Uh, was that when you got the company or was it hunker down, solve some problems? And then you said, hey, we got to hit the road. We're going to go visit stores. We're going to you know, find out what's out there and, and bring it back to the organization. Both. I decided I wanted to go visit the stores right away to get a feel for the business. But I've always been hunkered down. This day and age, you can take your laptop with you. Someone posted on Facebook this morning, and one of my comments about being on a road, one of my posts about being a road, on a road trip, and he said, well, do you ever work? <laughs> so I made a video today. I'm going to post it of me working and just see how exciting it is for people to watch. So yes, my posts are more about taking road trips and the joys of discovering these wonderful places along the side of the road, because I think that's more interesting than watching me answer emails, but I am working as well. And so I did go on the road trip to get a feel for the brand. And then I quickly recognized, like I said earlier, we don't own or operate our stores and we actually were out of compliance with franchise laws. And so we had to revert everything to licensing agreements and so we're now operating as a license. And I realized how we really were driving profit for this company was the sale of product. So that's why we invested in a manufacturing facility. The way you can control price on product is if you make it yourself. And so that's what we're doing. We're making our core product line ourselves and we can also control the quality. And all of our nuts are 100%, 100 sourced from local farmers. And it's the best quality you'll find anywhere. And I can really stand by it. So that's how we're growing the brand. That doesn't mean we're not about the story of the road trip, but how we're really driving the future of this company is selling our product. And we want to sell our product in the C-Store channels because those, those are our people. Uh, we're also looking at grocery channels and some tourist locations, hotel, gift shops, all of those kind of align with what our brand is about. And uh, on your website, um, a lot of cool stories on there, just kind of celebrating, just yeah. um, 
everybody has different memories over the years from their families, et cetera. But if you can't connect with one of those stories that's on the website, you probably didn't do much traveling because there's something there for everybody. And just it, it, it harkens back to memories I have and being in that station wagon and not having a seatbelt on and going around a corner and <laughs> yeah. sliding. It's like the kids and the dog all sliding from side to side when you're going around a, a, a turn. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing today, but, you know. But it was all, fun. Oh, yeah. And all <laughs> those, we somehow survived, right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. And, and how long you hold on to that um, rubber or plastic alligator. Um, yeah. You know, years later, you still have those things, and they're, they're, yeah. you pull them out of a box and you smile. But you know, those were sitting sitting in your room for years because it, it made you think immediately of that that great memory, that time out on that road, that time with your family, and you remember all the good times. You tend not to to remember some of the the less good times. And they still sell. I mean, that's a great thing. But you also made a point about, well, there's, there's something for everyone. And we have this guest book, which is wonderful. And people go on and share their stories of Stuckies. And I absolutely love reading those. If I have a, a day that's particularly challenging, I'll go online and I'll read those stories. And it will remind me, this is why I sunk my life savings and I'm working my tail off to revive this company. This is why I'm doing it. It's those memories, but it's not just remembering, it's creating new memories for, for new people and the next generation, and that's starting to happen. I'm starting to meet more people in their 30s and their 20s who say, I love to road trip, and my parents told me about Stuckey's. So we're getting to that next generation, which gives me hope. So uh, for those in our industry, uh, particularly those in Georgia, uh, they may want to give you some thanks because um, I was in a, a restaurant in Athens, Georgia uh -huh. called Trapeze. And uh, yeah. <laughs> walked in there, and it's like, I that that name's familiar. That that face is familiar. They have a picture of you at the wait yes. stand, yes. and it basically <laughs> says, "Thank you to Stephanie for was it um, beer beer?" And it it has to do with the um, getting laws passed. Uh, you were in the Georgia legislature, and you helped pass full strength beer laws for the state of Georgia. Is that correct? I did. Yeah, so not to toot my own horn, but toot toot, this really is what I am most proud of. 14 years in the legislature, my biggest accomplishment was passing what we called the Better Bill, Beer, the Better Beer Bill, say that three times fast, the Better Bill, Beer Bill, allowed higher alcohol content beer to be sold in the state. So before that passed in 2004, there were at the time there were some 800 types of beers that you could not sell in Georgia. Now that would skyrocket because the craft beer industry has just become so hot. And so it would I I pushed it as an economic case that why are we shutting out this incredible industry that can build community, that can create a sense of place? There's nothing better than a local brewery that really defines what a special town Athens is or Carrollton, Georgia, almost all these great towns throughout the country have little breweries or they make their own beer. And they weren't able to do that because we had a cap at the alcohol content on 6%. So I like, I like PBR too, but that's, that's like a PBR, right? Mm -hmm. So all the crofts and the lagers and the, and the stouts, you couldn't, you couldn't buy them mm -hmm. in Georgia. You would have to go to another state. It took me six years to pass that bill. I got beat down repeatedly by entities that I think just misunderstood the bill. And they thought I was out to get a bunch of people drunk. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It's it, it's about the finer things in life, including good beer. Well, like I said, uh, trapeze, if you go to Athens and go yeah. to the restaurant trapeze, you can see your picture there. Yeah. Geez, if only Stuckey's had a beer. Yeah, we do. I know. That was my yeah. setup. <laughs> that was a softball. Okay. Yes. I'm hitting that one. Yes. So Wild Heaven Brewery in Atlanta has done a limited run. They've done two batches and I bet they'll do another one. It does really well seasonally in the fall. So my guess is they'll ramp it up again in the fall. 
but we'll sell them our pecans and they'll actually use our product in the beer and it tastes like a pecan log roll, but not too sweet. It's a thick beer. It's got some cherry undertones and a little hint of vanilla. And, you, you know, it's not like you drink three or four at a time. It's more mm-hmm. one to be savored at the end of a meal. But it's they did an amazing job with it. So for those cruising around Georgia, where can they find that? Right now, it's just being sold in Atlanta at Wild Heaven Brewery. But I know that the owner was working with some distribu- his distributor. And I'm forgetting the distributor. But... Mm-hmm. You know, you have to go through the distributor for alcohol sales in the state. So that will open us up to see store channels. And I would love it. You know, the fun thing about convenience stores is so many of them are embracing the craft beer movement. And you'll see beer caves. You'll see walk-in coolers that really feature some excellent brews. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's great to see. Like, it's all about convenience and making these wonderful products accessible and affordable. So is there a book or anything like it, that in your future and looking at road trips and how to, uh, the, the phrase that that's on your website, highway happiness. Find highway happiness. That was my grandfather's, one of his slogans. The other was every traveler was, is a friend. So everyone is welcome at Stuckey's. That's part of our DNA. Yeah. I'm working on a book. I've got three chapters written. I think I need six for my, I have a, I have a editor who's pitching it for me, an agent, sorry. Uh, and so he, he needs six chapters and all the, all the chapters outlined. And I keep, I keep changing it, but I'm pretty close to submitting that draft. Well, for anybody uh, who wants to submit story ideas for future chapters, follow Stephanie on her various social media. Um, now, before we wrap up, we always do something about this time in the, the broadcast where we do trivia. So we didn't tell you about that. But yes, every week we have trivia. I'm ready. Okay. And originally it, it, it was it was going to be a, a, a huge softball. I didn't know about the book, by the way. So that, that wasn't my softball. I was going to ask you how to pronounce the word P-E-C-A-N. Uh, but you already gave that one away. So I'm not going to do that. Well, I say both. I do say both. But yeah. Well, I, I heard somebody once say that one of them is what you use to go to the bathroom, the other one is what you use to eat. Yeah, what's wrong with those people? I don't know. <laughs> so we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to ask something. Uh, we had talked about Stuckey's as um, used to have Texaco gas. And so wanted to talk about the question today has to do with which one of, we're going to give you multiple choice. Which one of the following retailers never sold gas? And as, I, as we talked mm. about, Stuckey's did. Four choices. The Home Depot, Sears, Walmart, or Amazon. Which one never had retail gas? Oh, I'm going to say Amazon. Give her the ding ding. She is a winner. Yes. And uh, our winner today will get Stuckey's Pecan Beer. Uh, that's our prize for today. Uh, but anyway, going back to Amazon had convenience stores, but they don't sell fuel. Sears experimented with fueling in the 70s. Home Depot had had a concept called fuels uh, that they introduced right before the Great Recession. Uh, but they still have six stores left. And Walmart, of course, sells fuels. Um, so anyway, well done. Yay. Uh, that That's because of a life on the road that you know these things. Um, we're... we're Finishing up and talking about road trips, is there any advice that you have for folks who hit the road? How do you plan out trips? What do you what do you look for? Do you let the road find you or do you find things out on the road when or is it a combination depending upon your mood? It's a combination, but I do really plan out the trips because I want to make sure I don't miss stuff. So there's a couple of sites I really use. Atlas Obscura and Roadside America are two that have apps. I see you nodding, so Mm -hmm. you enjoy those. So you can put in your route if you pay to be a subscriber for Roadside America. So I really, it's it's so affordable. And so they'll tell you all along your route the fun places to go. And it's stuff like the world's largest ball of twine. And then uh, I've started geeking out on another site that's WPA Murals. 
And so if you're into that, you know, some, you know, I love, uh, like there's a, uh, Philip G- Gustin, mm-hmm. WPA mural in Conyers, Georgia at the post office. And, and that mural is worth millions of dollars. And it's just hanging up there by one of the greatest artists of the 1960s and 70s. So I like those sort of obscure things that other people may not notice. And then the last site I look at is called Road Arch. Dot com, so it's roadside architecture. Mm-hmm. And they'll p- point out things like, here's where you'll find a Shoney's Big Boy or an old Tasty Freeze, or here's a really great motel with an original 1950s neon sign. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of hunt down those as well. Yeah, that's... And then Google, just Google. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you do Google Maps, you know, they'll, they'll give you recommendations. So that's also a good resource. And then Google has the function where you can click to avoid highways. So if I'm really feeling adventurous and I'm not pushed for time, I will use the avoid highways. And that's when you just stumble upon stuff that's like, oh my God, I didn't mm-hmm. know that there was a museum for small chairs, which by the way, I discovered just taking the back roads. And it's signed next to it says, please don't sit on chairs. Yeah, they don't want you to sit on the chairs. They're the exhibit. <laughs> So, and, and it's also 20,000 of them. <laughs> that's a lot. So, um, wow, you can play before a pretty big audience if you can fill all those seats, I guess. But, um, yeah, like when you think about different areas of the country, I when I think of Howard Johnson's, I'm from the Northeast, I think fried clams. Uh, yeah. you talk to people from the South, and it's like motels. So, you yeah. know, it's all about hitting the road and, and getting different perspectives. Um, before we also uh, leave today, how can people find you? Uh, because if they can't hit the road, they can certainly learn a lot from following you, your adventures, and uh, learning more about Stuckies. Sure. I'm on all the social media channels. I'm on TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn and Facebook, it's just under my name, Stephanie Stuckey. And the other sites, it's at Stucky Stop, all one word. Well, Stephanie, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you on the road. And maybe sometime in the future, we can join you on the road. So oh, that thank- would be so much fun. Let's take a road trip and tape it, do a little video. That would be awesome. Well, we should go. We'll have to do that. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And for those who enjoyed today's episode and want to subscribe, please do. Uh, we try to, with this month, we're telling stories about road trips, but every month, every week, we tell different stories and join us weekly. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.